So um, I've noticed that most talks you see about microservices services tend to be focused on why you should switch, how to break up the monolith, or counter presentations defending monolithic designs, which are wrong. I've done any scientific empirical research on this, it's just an observation. Now, I've uh, learned quite a few lessons over the years of doing this sort of work. We've tried uh, various companies I've been at, many things that did not work out. And uh, my thinking of, around this approach uh, has evolved along the way. Um, and I would like to share some of those observations, specifically what it's like to work in an environment. Um, now, I assume most people here have heard the term microservices, but I'm curious if anyone here is actually also working in an environment like that. Anyone? Yeah, cool. Anybody's company thinking about moving to one? Yeah, I know. It's, uh, yeah. And for those of you who don't raise their hands, let's go over this super quickly. So just quickly, the promise of microservices <laughs> is you get to take very difficult. <laughs> I've used this slide a few times, and I'm the only one, so thank you, Alvaro, wherever you are. Um, you get to take the, this very difficult and complicated monolithic application and convert it into much smaller systems, each of which has their own set of complications. Now, in theory, this provides many advantages. I have, uh, I, can, I have reduced my coupling. I have forced programmatic context boundaries that make my teams talk to each other. I can scale into, into things very efficiently. I can move quickly you know, in terms of features once I'm up and running. Um, now, while this pattern does have some attractive features and makes certain aspects easier, microservices come with their own sets of difficulties. Now, if you're working with microservices, you may have just joined a team or joined a team that's already doing it. Uh, you are going, it's going to seem a bit overwhelming at first. You may feel alone. You may wonder what horrible things you've done to be in this position with all these little complicated code bases and you can't run anything, you can't run the entire application on your laptop at any one point. It can be daunting. Or you're in a group that's frustrated with their monolith and are planning on splitting up like these people over here. Um, be warned that it will not be easy. Unless you're a brand new startup, you likely didn't start from the beginning with microservices. Now, I like this image, because it looks like the wrecking ball is like, caught in the building, like the wire's like holding on, which I think is an apt comparison, because when starting the monolithic breakdown, you're going to get caught up or stuck in the process. Now, I should say that it, you should, if anyone's wondering, like, oh man, I wish we had not done the monolith, uh, I wish we had started the microservices, no, you really, uh, we, if I have time, we'll get to this later, but you absolutely do want to start with the monolith uh, because you don't, uh, the, having the monolith allows you to identify where your proper functional boundaries are, which are the ideal place to start cutting away and making microservices. And when you're starting out, you don't know where those are. So, um, either way, the purpose of this talk is to instead provide you with a checklist or a survival guide of things to look out for. Now, I think these are all useful regardless of your manager, if you're just joining the team, do not be afraid to ask these questions in your group, even if you're the most junior person on your team. And if you are the most junior person on your team, you're gonna look like a genius. Um, for those of you who are working within a microservice environment, you may know these things already. Uh, but follow along with this list, and hopefully you can, hopefully you agree with what I'm saying here, and if you think there's anything that I've missed, let me know. I would love to add this to the list. Now, I should point out before I get going, that this is mostly from my perspective, working from small to medium-sized companies. If you work for something like, if you're from a company like Netflix, you're gonna have entirely different sets of challenges than I've run into. Um, I should also point out uh, that I only have a half an hour. Uh, I've done this before in an hour, so I've cut out a lot of things, and this talk is purposefully bad. So normally when you give talks, you're supposed to be slow and articulate and look at the crowd. I'm gonna go as fast as I possibly can. There are many little things, oh, bam, 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 bam. So get ready, here we go. First, I've broken this, topic, uh, this talk up into four different uh, sections. Infrastructure, software architecture, team communication, and some miscellaneous points. Uh, now, this being DevOps, most of the, uh, most of the uh, points I'm gonna raise and the stuff that I did not cut out is all in this section. Um, now, there's a reason why I start with infrastructure because what may not be immediately obvious when you adopt microservices is that, yeah, my little independent functional components tend to be very easy to reason about. But I trade that simplicity for a vastly increased uh, amount of complexity in the general infrastructure. Uh, application environments, deployments, build pipelines, you name it. Many talks you'll see focus explicitly on different subjects related to infrastructure for the microservices. E.g., here's how we monitor our stuff. Here's how we do deployment pipelines. In other words, your team will be spending a non-zero amount of time doing DevOps and infrastructure work that you wouldn't have to necessarily worry about uh, in a monolithic environment. So first up, uh, how do we manage the logs? Um, basically, centralized logging should be your number one priority. Uh, they are absolutely critical, uh, and um, you know, basically, if you have to SSH into a box at all ever to look at the log, to look at you know var log, then you have failed and you're doing things wrong. Now, for us, um, you know, I'm 
and if you're not sure exactly where to start, uh, here's what we did uh, in, my last, in my last job. This worked out pretty well for us. So uh, one platform that I recommend that I have experience with is the ILK stack, which stands for uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Logstash is the log aggregator, Elasticsearch is the uh, repository we store these things, and Kibana is a visualization tool. Um, you can set up alerts and triggers uh, for various events, various uh, uh, log levels you might see, et cetera. Uh, it's all very nice and very open source. Now our diagram, um, this diagram is kind of showing our first attempt at this. We had many more than five services and many individual instances of them, but basically what was happening is that there was an asynchronous log uh, process that was basically reading the logs as they were appended to on each individual service and shipping them to a centralized component uh, known as uh, Logstash. They would take those logs and then push them into Elasticsearch, and then of course I'm missing the Kibana image, we use Kibana for visualizations. However, um, we were a small team at the time, and managing uh, the ILK cluster can take, uh, require some focus that we didn't, weren't able to spare it as, as an individual. You know, we, couldn't, we couldn't spare engineering time to focus on it. You have to tune it periodically, set up index rotations or deletions. You'll, uh, you will inevitably fill up, fill up the disk and crash it. Um, so we were realizing that we were spending more of our time sort of focused on that, and we wanted to want to get some features done, so we started to look for a third-party service to help us out. Um, we went with a tool called Logly, uh, as they were the most cost-effective for us, and the switch was pretty painless. You can set up Logstash to forward to both Elasticsearch and Logly, so we ran like that for a while until we realized that Logly was doing a really good job, and we dropped Elasticsearch altogether. So, and now, now it's Logly solely. Now this, this is useful for us as a small team. If you're a larger company, you may want to take on, the, on that responsibility and not pay a third-party services as a, as a dependency on your logging uh, visualization. Next up, um, what about metrics and telemetry? Do you have any metrics? Do you have any telemetry? Uh, it's absolutely essential that you extract as much data out of your system as possible. Uh, many of you out there are probably saying, well, yeah, of course. However, it can be easy to, the easy thing to ignore for a while. A guy, you know, I've seen this plenty of times. You start in a startup, you start building, and some of the, some of the secondary off stuff is, sort of falls by the wayside as your CEO is pushing out you to push new features, and you don't have time to sell that up. Um, now there are third-party services like AppDynamics, Datadog, and Splunk can help make sense of these numbers. Uh, there's many services and tools out there that can help you with this sort of telemetry. It's kind of staggering how many services, how many companies out there will actually help you with this. Um, do a quick search when you have a chance. It's pretty funny. Also pretty funny, the AppDynamics and the Splunk logo are basically the same. I don't know which one is which. Um, uh, of of these, I'd suggest Datadog. Uh, several people I respect swear by it. Uh, my last job, we had to set up our own metric system, and we were looking we were looking towards uh, switching to Datadog. We kept planning, kept pushing it off. Uh, their sales guy kept uh, calling and uh, hounding us to to <laughs> hey to to uh, to, uh, to to switch. Uh, my, the new job I just started, and I, I hope there's a Datadog representative in this room right now because they are literally on the floor above us. Ah, oh, it's so fun. Okay. Uh, anyway, if you're like us and you like to host it yourself, so uh, you, there's a few free tools out there. Uh, the world of metrics is an interesting domain. Uh, there's different approaches from this, uh, you know, uh, different approaches to the transmission. You have some um, metrics utilities that will pull, or sorry, push, and others that, are, that, that require some sort of aggregator to pull you. Uh, different visualization technologies to sit on top. I'm a huge fan of this tool called Grafana, which, which is a visual, visualization tool that allows you to sit on different types of aggregation systems. Um, and it's designed specifically around collecting, storing, and alerting on metrics from a variety of different aggregation sources. Uh, when I was interviewing at the current job I have now, uh, I walked in and they had you know, a wall of nine huge screen monitors with all different Grafana boards, and every team had their own TV with Grafana board set up, and I was like, that's it. I don't need to go anywhere else. They're doing it exactly right. Now, before I go any further, I should probably stop for a second. I'm only two recommendations in this presentation, and I just want to point out something we probably shouldn't gloss over. First off, centralized logs and metrics are important in a monolithic environment as well, uh, but they become even more interesting in a distributed system. Now, I've just talked about adopting, I've also just talked about adopting two entirely new concepts that aren't simply catchphrases or library you can drop in. These are entire systems you have to manage, unless you want to pay for a SaaS service to do it for you. Uh, but even still, there are considerations. Now, basically, your infrastructure needs to scale along with your application. It's probably pretty obvious to hear, but in other words, um, you need to ensure that these logging systems, these metric systems, can scale and that they can handle the load that your individual services are going to throw at them. If 
I scale up my individual instances for like the order pr processing system or whatever, suddenly, and I flood my Elasticsearch cluster with log messages, how quickly can it scale to handle that? Will it scale to handle that? Will it top over? Will it fill up the disk and crash? My metric server cannot handle the flood of new connections that are actually coming into the new box. These systems require their own architecture and design. If I'm using a SaaS offering, you should know these limits as well. What happens if I scale up rapidly and need to make a bunch of new requests to uh, new connections through a third-party service? What if I hit a rate limit uh, on uh, on this on Logly as I'm trying to bring up the number of services? What what do I do if they reject my connection? Um, furthermore, your individual service may get a bit more complicated uh, in its deployment. You know, you may package everything in a Docker container. But uh, you need to understand if you're logging and your metrics utilities make synchronous calls or asynchronous calls to deliver their information. Um, if I record a metric, are the collector dealt with async? Is there a secondary process that I need to have running on my system to ensure? So as an example, I may have uh, my standard, standard out logging that goes, that ends up uh, putting all logs in var log, and I may have to start up a separate process to run and read var log and then push it off somewhere else. And that has to be packaged as part of the individual deployment uh, container. Uh, or whatever you use to package AMI, et cetera, that goes out. Um, as an example, I come. I have an uh, uh, extensive Java background, and we're a big fan of a tool called Logback. And they provide a, uh, a, a plugin called uh, the Log, Logstash TCP socket appender for uh, Logback. And this is, this is actually pretty great because it simplifies a lot of that. With just this uh, XML configuration, I now have an asynchronous process that automatically starts whenever my system starts up and is able to uh, directly append and push to Logstash. So very easy to worry about, um, but you know other systems may not have that particular uh, approach. Uh, basically, these requirements are going to start costing you money, either from the SaaS service or self-hosting or engineering team spent on them, and you'll likely need to devote dedicated engineering time to it or start hiring. These efforts uh, can act as the initial, st these individual efforts, setting up metrics, setting up logging, can act as the initial steps for the founding of a dedicated cyber liability engineering team, for example. Um, and I should, I'll probably also point out that I'm not one, I'm not what one of you might consider to be an SRE. I don't have the expertise, but I'm totally fascinated with build pipelines and managing Kubernetes, et cetera. Uh, and I find that app developers tend to be, uh, let's say, not focused on system resources or constraints. And I mean this in the nicest way possible, but one thing I've always seen time and time again is that ops engineers tend to become something like um, an exhausted or flabbergasted parent. So like, I, t I tell my kids, why are you trying to stick your finger in the electrical socket? You know, similar to why are you trying to open up a database connection on every single iteration of the loop? Why, you know, something like that. And so I find that they have to come in and be like, hmm, you know, and they, they, they can influence app design. Okay, next. Uh, <laughs> how and where are our builds done? So uh, I would recommend Jenkins at a minimum. There's a bunch, I'm, I'm gonna start getting even faster because I'm running low on time. Uh, look into services like Travis CI. I had a great conversation with somebody from Circle CI yesterday. Uh, these tools provide excellent automated build and deployment pipelines that will save you tons of time and provide uniformity in the way that your code is managed. <sighs> yep, we gotta have more than 10 minutes, which is vital in work with microservices, which generally means that you're gonna have a bunch of repositories. Um, now, I really uh, only have much experience with Jenkins, but I must say I'm, I, I think it's an incredibly powerful tool, especially the latest versions of Jenkins Pipeline, going back to, uh, what is it, infrastructure as code. One of their latest things is they, they require you, or they like, give you the option to create a, uh, a file just called Jenkins file. And you can put it in your code repos and it describes how your particular service should be built uh, every single time it is pushed to Jenkins. Uh, it can also, or it's pushed to GitHub. Uh, so if I open up a PR uh, for a branch, Jenkins will uh, see it via webhook, build it, and then alert GitHub, GitHub if there's success or failures. Um, on a side note, uh, this, this, this area is one thing that I think is actually much easier with microservices. Monoliths can acquire many long-running tests. I'm sure we've all been in an environment where the, or the app takes 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour to run the test suite. Uh, developers start to ignore it and push code and it breaks. So uh, having a much smaller, tightly focused uh, uh, service unit allows for much faster deployments, I think. Uh, sorry, builds. Next, how do we deploy the code? Uh, when deploying code, the goal is don't do anything by hand. A good deployment process uh, is, is like a modern assembly line. No need for humans, except for perhaps final examination of the product. Uh, you should have push button, one click deployments, or some sort of other control plane that allows you to get done in one uh, single way. That, that's, that's the, you know, the, the, the different systems may be, uh, or the systems may be different underneath, but the actual deployment release process should be uniform across uh, every service. Uh, and honestly, I'm, even, I'm kind of embarrassed I took this photo because I do not recommend using Jenkins for deploys. Uh, just don't do it. 
um, do you have any coding conventions? And that is, do you force your builds through a check style? Do you have a minimum of code coverage you accept? How, uh, do all of your builds, um, you should have all your builds pass through a bunch of quality gates in order, to be, in order to be ready for release. You should agree on a minimum level of acceptance and outright fail any build that does not meet any of these. Um, so uh, if you have many services being developed independently, it's possible that styles, code structure, and testing quality, et cetera, may start diverging as you have teams that are running in isolation from each other for years. Um, if you have to move team members around, you want to make sure the transition is as easy as possible for them by ensuring that the code that they're going to be looking at is as similar as possible to the last service or project. Um, and of course, monitor things regularly. One tool I love is called SonarCube. Has anyone here used SonarCube before? Yeah, it's great. So uh, it displays a variety of things, um, one of which is you know, it basically grades your code as it comes through. Now, of course, I only show stuff that's passed and has nice, not relatively nice uh, ratings. But um, I've seen it, you know, I, um, I've seen it fail a build, give me an F rating because I uh, concatenated a string as opposed to using a string builder to build up a string. It is very aggressive, very powerful. Um, one other cool thing it does is it shows you how much time it thinks it'll take for you to fix all of your stuff based on, and it, it, takes, and it takes into consideration stuff like uh, code reviews and scrum meetings and things like that. So it might not literally take you 20 minutes to type it out, but it might take you 20 minutes to walk through the whole process to release. Next, can I generate a service template? And by that I mean uh, when a developer needs to build a new service, they should not have to re-implement the wheel. They should be able to go to a URL and get something that uh, maybe has, maybe is version, but it basically has a structure that allows you to, uh, uh, it basically deals deals away with the initial, basically infrastructure you set up a new service, stuff like setting up a database configuration, you know, how do I deal with, config with general configuration, et cetera, et cetera, project structure. Last, in, in infrastructure, how do we share code? And this is a bit of a trick question because I really dislike tight coupling and microservices really lend themselves well to avoid it if you do it right. So with microservices, it is totally okay to re-implement some code on every service. I think it is better to uh, allow, to have that, to have duplicated code rather than to have some sort of uh, coupling between some sort of resource, some sort of shared library. Um, you should set up your own internal artifactory. Um, and you, you know, it, it is acceptable to share infrastructure libraries, so very low level things like a common communication pattern, but you should never, ever, ever share business logic between services and never share domain objects or models. Now some of you might be thinking, but I have a person object. This person, this address object, this person object should exist every single place. Uh, every service has a different understanding of what that person uh, object represents. One service may care about the, just the email address. Another one may care about the name and the full address. They are, they may, you may call them the same, but they're represented differently in every system. Oh, I was wrong, there's still more. How do we manage our multiple environments? And for that, I mean, is your production environment wired hand by hand on AWS instances? And my God, I hope not. Do we use tools like Ansible or Terraform, et cetera, to manage to do this for us? Or do, you, do we use a third party or a service? Because the microservice architecture can lead towards a ridiculous amount of infrastructure, infrastructure work, many organizations are working to solve this problem, both in terms of tooling um, uh, to full platforms. Now, I have, fa have had great success for the past three years with uh, Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, it's much easier to work with now than it used to be. And if you haven't, I would go and download a tool called, um, a researcher tool called Minikube. It has a great introduction to how Kubernetes works and teaches you all the basic concepts. It's really good stuff. Because it can allow you to do things like, um, well, so we, we stumbled across it because we needed a way to take, all, uh, take uh, to create many different environments for our sales guys. And we needed a way to uh, have, a, have a way to spin up the entire environment uh, so the developers could work on it because there was no way you could spin up the entire environment on a given laptop. So what, we've, what we, we started using Kubernetes as a development environment. So with the click of a button, we'd have our own independent developer namespace is the terminology. And then I could disconnect uh, from the cluster, my, or from the namespace, my particular service that I was working on and then trick the Kubernetes cluster into thinking my laptop was part of the cluster, um, which, uh, which then basically gives me the full environment to test in. Doesn't work so well when you're like commuting on the train, but when you're in their office, it's great. Um, and then that initially, and then that led, led into being able to spin up arbitrary staging environments for the sales guys, and then from then on to production. So that leads into a point called uh, that I like to think of as uh, testing and developing in isolation, or rather, uh, you should test and develop in your own in your own isolated environment. And if, if every team member is contributing to one environment, you will step on each other's toes or get in each other's way. So your organization should provide mechanisms that allow your application developers to test their code in isolation before it's released. And it should be scalable. So going back to uh, what I was talking earlier, um, I'll give an example of something I've done in the past that combines these points regarding builds. 
handling one or two builds uh, with Jenkins is fine, but can your CI CD pipeline handle dozens or hundreds of developers constantly pushing fixes at it? So we use Jenkins by default, and uh, or sorry, we use Jenkins, and by default it spawns or it gives you two worker processes to handle builds. And that's fine for a handful of devs, devs, but it's not fine when they need to scale. So Jenkins has an option uh, where it can spawn actual distinct and isolated nodes as AWS instances to do their work. So our basic flow was something like you push to Git. Git, uh, Git sends a webhook to Jenkins. Jenkins goes cool and starts up a little service, uh, a secondary uh, se or, or a, a node. It's basically, I think it's, I think it's wrapped in a Docker container. I forget at this point. It then goes to GitHub and pulls down your changes, and it wraps. Uh, it pulls down. You basically, with Jenkins file, you can basically specify. I also need a MySQL database. I need a Rabbit instance. I need a bunch of other things, and it pulls them down as individual Docker containers, and it runs your integration tests in, in this in this ephemeral environment. And then on, on failure, uh, one of the bad parts here is this will all go away as soon as we're done. So one of the things we had to do is on failure, uh, ship up the workspace uh, which, and send it over to S3. And then the thing disappears, but I still have my, my error logs and failed tests and everything. I can go look at that. Um, on success, though, it packages everything up and sends it to Docker. So now I have a Docker container for my particular branch, for my particular feature, maybe master, that's sitting and ready to go for deployments. Uh, it's pretty cool. And then the environment goes away, totally isolated. Takes minutes to run, very useful. Okay, I don't have much time left. So this is going to go real fast. Uh, do you have an overall design vision when you're when you're when you're building uh, when you're building your systems? Does anyone here know what we're doing? You need a person with the entire vision of your microservices environment uh, ready to go to answer questions, or grow larger, a team or a council to help people move forward. Um, which technologies do we use, uh, and how much freedom do we have in choosing technologies? Now I've grouped these next two because this is a really interesting problem. One of the great promises of microservices is that we can choose any language we want, the right tool for the job. In reality, you want to be as boring as possible. Why? Because uh, it'll be easier to hire, and uh, because if you hire somebody that knows Go, and they're the only person that knows Go, and they quit, what are you going to do? Right? So you should be very reluctant, uh, very careful in choosing new, test, new tech. Uh, how do we test an individual service? By very thorough integration tests. Integration tests are the best tests. TDD is fine, but if I can spin up uh, an environment with real, uh, real databases and real RabbitMQ and flood it with data, uh, that is much more valuable to me because I end up exercising the entire system. I apologize for the brevity, but here we go. How do we test the platform as a whole? Um, that is an extremely difficult and slow thing to do. I need to spin up the entire service platform. I need to get, it, get all the data into a set steady state, pump it with events, shut it down, reset all of that for every single test. So, and this is going to be very controversial, and every time I tell it to people, they tell me, I'm crazy, consider not testing the platform. Don't do it. Instead, monitor error rates. So if I see, suddenly see a spike, blam, then I know something went horribly, horribly wrong right around that time, and I should look and see what was deployed, and I should pull it out immediately and try and, try and, uh, try and fix whatever happened. And that is easy to get, um, or should be, if I've set up metrics properly. So uh, next, how do our services communicate? And by that I mean HTTP versus async events. Everyone I've talked to uh, that does microservices always does point-to-point HTTP -point communications, and that's fine, but that's synchronous. Um, async uh, event communication uh, is a little bit more complicated to think about, um, but is a lot more reactive. We could talk about this for uh, easily an hour, but I have negative one minute. Um, so, but both these approaches require infrastructure changes of their own. If I'm using, doing HTTP, I need service discovery mechanisms. If I'm doing async events, I need some sort of message broker like Kafka or RabbitMQ. Uh, uh, but either way, whichever one I decide, you better have some sort of circuit breaker to make sure that these systems aren't um, bogging each other down, or a dead letter mechanism to handle if uh, something fails to deliver a message to somebody. Uh, do we follow an overall architecture style? And this would be a whole long, um, you know, uh, what's the word? I pontificate on this for a while. But basically, just if you haven't read this book, Go read this book, Domain Driven Design. It is the best way to, that I've found to change my life to designing big, uh, complicated systems. And the approach that the author recommends scales out to microservices very well. In fact, there's a link at the end of this where the guy, the author, Eric Evans, uh, it gives a talk about a year ago where he's like, wow, this is a perfect application to solving the microservices design. Um, take photos. How do we create new service? Uh, what, how much is each service responsible for? When do we create one? Um, Basically, uh, initially you design your platform around bounded context from the DDD world. Uh, don't create services just because we feel like it. You know, don't do it. It's not, it's not going to work. Don't create services that are basically just CRUD wrappers around your database. 
So if all it's doing is it's handling requests and going to a database, that's not a good use case. Um, do make an effort to identify boundaries, uh, communication functional areas. I can, this is a complicated concept, which I should uh, talk about later. Um, ensure a service will have proper contract boundaries before creating. Again, if I have more time to talk about DDD, this would make a lot more sense. Now this is an important point and it's easily accessible. If I have two services that need to communicate synchronously frequently, they are good candidates for actually merging. So if you're under a situation where I have two servers that are highly dependent on each other, they should just do one. Um, last, uh, the number of services should be uh, less than the number of developers. <laughs> Gets out of hand. Okay, uh, I, got, I got like three slides left. Um, team communication, normally I would talk about this for like 15 minutes talking about how we do code reviews, how we organize team structure, how the value of keeping persistent teams. But time, for time's sake, uh, I just wanna make one point. Who here has heard of Conway's Law? It's real. Right? If I, if it, it basically, it's, it's, a, it's a law that basically says uh, the, the, the design of a system is going to reflect the uh, communication patterns of the, of the actual people involved. So if the people aren't talking, your system is going to be a mess. Um, but if they are talking, then the system comes out with nice, clean APIs. And microservices are a way to not actually force a hard programmatic bounded context so people are forced to talk to each other. And it's great. Uh, so last thing, I got two points left. Miscellaneous advice. Uh, don't get cute with naming of services. Any idea what these do? <laughs> right? This one, so this one, uh, there's one there called uh, supplication. All right. All right? All right? Does anyone know what the word supplicate means? It means like penance or whatever? This was a system that basically handled people's applications to work, for, to work with us, right? Why, I, you should just call it the application, customer application service, right? Don't get cute. I just started a new company and we started naming a service, uh, somebody named us a new service, Abacus. And I was like, no, no, what does that do? Does it count things? Call it the counting thing service. It's fine. <laughs> it's boring, it's fine. <laughs> uh, if you have a new feature, walk backwards from the user, we'll see. You, you'd be surprised when people started like the database level and they get to the front end and everything's a mess. And it's gonna hop around between different services. Start at the UI first. Uh, release, release when a feature is ready. Don't be afraid of bugs. Just push it, it's gonna be fine. Um, if service A has another service dependency on B, is it a dependency? Release B first. Avoid situations where they both have to go at the same time because it generates maintenance windows. That's a hard one to do. How to bootstrap a new service. I don't have time for that one. Uh, <laughs> API, API message versioning is just a thing. Like if you have stuff communicating, it's gonna change it over time and you're gonna eventually have to start addressing APIs and event versioning. It's very complicated. We could talk about that for an hour. And finally, don't release on Friday afternoons. <laughs> and I'm done. Wow. <laughs>